Well, good morning. Uh, a few moments ago, I swore in Colonel Jerry Jones as the superintendent of the Maryland State Police. Now, I want to thank the members of the legislature for acting quickly to get him confirmed uh, at this critical, critical time for our state. Uh, we now have well over 100 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the Washington region, including 37 cases here in Maryland. 11 days ago, I declared a state of emergency. And on Friday, the president declared a national emergency in response to this crisis. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute uh, of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, said yesterday, if it looks like you're overreacting, you're probably doing the right thing. He warned that Americans should be prepared that they're going to have to hunker down significantly more than we as a country are doing in order to fight this outbreak. Last week, we closed schools across the state. We issued guidance to restrict visitors to hospitals and nursing homes and enacted an executive order to prohibit all gatherings and events of more than 250 people. We closed the cruise terminal at the Port of Baltimore and directed a period of mandatory telework for all state employees. This week that weekend, we shut down all Maryland casinos, racetracks, and simulcast betting facilities. As I have repeatedly stressed, we should continue to expect the number of cases to dramatically and rapidly rise. We have never faced anything like this before. This is going to be much harder, take much longer, and be much worse than almost anyone is currently understanding. And unfortunately, far too many people have continued uh, to uh, ignore those warnings and are crowding into bars and restaurants, willingly putting the health and safety of others in grave danger. Decision makers at the federal, state, and local level are going to have to take drastic actions right now uh, that may seem scary, they may sound extreme, they will be terribly disruptive, but they are also absolutely necessary to save the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans. Every single one of us needs to take serious actions to immediately limit day-to-day -day interactions and activities, and we need to do our part to stop this deadly virus from spreading. This morning, I received a thorough briefing from my Unified Command Task Force and convened another emergency meeting of my coronavirus response team. At the advice of senior government leaders and security leaders and the top doctors and scientists across the state, we have made the decisions to take the following unprecedented immediate actions in order to protect public health and safety. I have just enacted an executive order to shut down all bars, restaurants, movie theaters, and gyms across the state effective at 5 p.m. today, while allowing drive-through, carry-out, and food delivery service to continue. Following updated CDC guidelines, we are prohibiting any social, community, religious, recreational, sports gatherings, or events of more than 50 people in close proximity at all locations, establishments, and venues all across Maryland. These emergency orders carry the full force of the law and will be strictly enforced. We have activated 250 Maryland State Police troopers of the mobile field force who are ready for deployment. As we said on Thursday, essential services such as grocery stores, food delivery, pharmacies, gas stations, banks, and other essential services need to remain open. In my direction, we are marshalling every tool in the arsenal of public health to combat this crisis and slow the spread of this pandemic. I have enacted an executive order directing the Maryland Department of Health 
to conduct an assessment to open closed hospital facilities across the state and to take other measure, measures ne necessary to immediately increase our capacity by an additional 6,000 beds in order to meet the demand created by the escalating spread of this virus. We have also activated the Maryland Medical Reserve Corps, a force of 5,000 dedicated and trained medical volunteers who are ready to assist in a public health emergency. 700 members of the Reserve Corps have already been activated for deployment. Under my executive order, any practitioner who holds a valid out-of-state license or expired Maryland medical license will be able to practice here in Maryland during this state of emergency. We have also directed the Maryland Department of Health to establish and implement appropriate policies and procedures for receiving, stockpiling, and distributing all assets received by the state of Maryland from the strategic national stockpile. Over the weekend, we activated 400 Army and Air National Guard, including two companies of area support medical companies in order to carry out any necessary functions and critical areas of need in the coming weeks. At the direction of General Tim Gowan, today 1,000 Maryland National Guard soldiers and airmen have been fully activated. And another 1,200 guardsmen are currently on enhanced readiness with their bags packed, fully ready for activation. Today, I have also issued an executive order prohibiting utilities, including electric, gas, water, sewer, phone, cable TV, and internet service provider companies from shutting off any residential customers or charging any residential customer late fees. And I have en enacted an executive order prohibiting the eviction of any tenant during the state of the emergency. Finally, I am pleased to announce that Dr. Karen Salmon Superintendent of Schools has applied for a federal waiver, and beginning today, we have now the capability of providing three meals a day and a snack to students who need it while the schools are closed. We have 138 center, centers already up and operating to distribute these meals to children across the state. In addition, uh, later this evening, nine of the Maryland passengers who were aboard the Grand Princess and were transported to a military base in Georgia will be arriving back home to Maryland and will be in the care of the Maryland National Guard. I want to again reiterate uh, that it is impossible to know how long this threat will continue. What I do know is that we cannot afford to wait to take action. While these measures may seem extreme, if we do not take them now, it could be too late. I will make whatever decisions and take whatever actions are necessary to save the lives of thousands of Marylanders and to protect our way of life itself. Uh, with that, um, I'm going to take a few questions and then I'm going to have some others address particular issues. I do have a hard stop at 11.22 uh, because I'll be leaving for a uh, a call with all of the nation's governors, the president, the vice president, all the national federal leaders. So uh, I, somebody's going to have to give me a, a little hook when I have to run, uh, but I'll take a few questions and I'll, I'll let the others stay and answer whatever questions they can. Yes. Well, you'll, you'll see uh, local law enforcement agencies enforcing them along with the state police and, if necessary, the National Guard. And there are strict uh, penalties and they will be enforced. We're no longer asking for people's cooperation. Uh, so I'll let some of the security team address that in further detail, but uh, we're not fooling around anymore. Again, I'll give you a quick answer and let uh, Dr. Salmon address that in more detail. But um, I, I, as I said, it's impossible to know how long this is going to take. I know that folks are talking about that it, that it probably or possibly will take much longer than two weeks. Um, I don't think we know the answer to that yet, but I'm going to let Dr. Salmon address uh, that in greater detail. Is there any other news on the April primary? 
Um, that's one that we are uh, actively taking a look at, but quite frankly, today was about saving lives and stopping people from getting out there before St. Patrick's Day. We'll try to maybe tackle that one tomorrow, uh, but we are working on uh, contingencies and getting input about what we have to do about the, uh, the April primary. Yes, excellent question. So uh, with respect to the shops, we're, we've been discussing those things. We don't want anyone congregating with more than 50 people in one place, regardless of what kind of a facility it is. But we don't want to completely shut down commerce, and we want people to get the things that they need. So we'll be addressing those as we go on. We don't want large you know, crowds of people in small, confined places, but we want as much as possible for daily life to go on and people to still get the things that they need, especially on essential services. It's going to be a huge hardship, and we have addressed both the uh, state legislature has addressed the leg emergency legislation that I hope to get from them today. Um, uh, I think we might get it today um, to sign into law that will address unemployment benefits here in Maryland and Congress. Uh, the House already passed uh, legislation. I'm not sure what the status is in the Senate, but there will be federal and state legislation to address all of the, you know, some of these financial hardships. Our Secretary of Commerce is, uh, and our Secretary of Labor are working on large groups and talking with federal officials. We, we know that many, many um, individuals who are going to be out of work, either because they're infected with COVID-19, they're in quarantine, or because their businesses are shut down, um, they're, they're going to be in real financial trouble. And I can tell you that the state and federal leaders are trying to do everything they possibly can to look at that eventuality. I think I'll let um, maybe Fran Phillips, who's our Deputy Secretary of Health, try to address some of those issues. Obviously, that's been all over the national news. We'll be, I think, talking about that with the President, Vice President, uh, HHS uh, Se Secretary Alex Azar, the head of the CDC, at, in, in just a few moments, and hopefully we'll get more guidance. It's, uh, they're trying to ramp it up at the federal level. We're trying to ramp it up at the state level. We're pushing to get drive-through uh, testing facilities open, but the real issue is the, the not if you don't have uh, the testing availability uh, from the labs, uh, the last thing we need is to push a bunch of people to think they're going to get a test and make them go into a drive through and then we can't really do the test and can't really get the results. So we're trying to get direction from the feds and we're trying to do everything we can at the state level. Yeah, Brad. So, so while it's, uh, it, it, it's a terrible situation for everybody involved, we're being more aggressive, I think, than some people because the hope is that while we can't avoid this infection, it is going to spread in Maryland, there are going to be big numbers of people infected, and there are going to be deaths. We're, by these actions, we're going to stop the spread, we're going to save lives, and we're going to try to bend that curve downward so we don't have this spike that overloads our healthcare system and our emergency rooms and our hospitals so we can't provide the care. We're trying to address all those issues. Um, and the, that's the, part of the good news is that we're, we're, I, we're hopefully starting early enough to stop some of the things that happened in, say, Italy. Uh, we would rather be Denmark or, you know, than Italy. Um, and, uh, you know, see what happened in Spain and France. Uh, we're trying to take actions earlier than other people around the country have or around the world have. Uh, but it's, uh, there's no real rosy picture. Uh, but the good news is that most people that get COVID-19 are not going to get really ill. That's the good news. It's a, it, they're going to get uh, s symptoms that are not that bad. They have to stay home, stay away from other people, and you'll get better. We already have people recovering. Um, it's just that vulnerable population of older adults and people with compromised the systems or underlying health conditions that the mortality rate is very high. Uh, and so we're trying to keep those people from getting infected by all the other people, like the ones that were crowded into bars all weekend. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really, I think we're going to get more. You, you can talk to medical professionals and get any number of ideas. The, the truth is nobody knows the answer to that question. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who seems to me is the guy that has been the most truthful and has the most information and uh, is a really smart guy, uh, has said anywhere from weeks to months, and that's about as general as you can get. Uh, 
We have the, the, uh, the leaders of our, all of our hospitals, our health department, maybe, um, and maybe that's something that uh, they can address in more detail after I've got to run. Uh, it depends on that, what we do, all of us, uh, what everybody does as far as stopping the transmission and we slow down the surge, if we stretch this out over a period of months, instead of everybody getting it at the same time, uh, and when we're gonna be over capacity or not. That's a big question that lots of really smart people are working on, but I wanna err on the side of caution by getting those new 6,000 beds up to speed as fast as possible. That's why I've directed them. We're looking into the possibility of all the closed hospitals that we can get back online I'm ordering them to try to get them online. The ex excess capacity in places where they have, uh, you know, parts of a hospital that are not operational, I want to say, what does it take to get them operational? But we don't know the exact answer, but we can talk in more detail. Governor, how big is that share of the National Health Service and other associations that are going to be deployed um, and, and are doing that time and all keeping it together? I see lots of other state colleges, teachers, and coaches, and schools, et cetera. Um, today, when you were talking to your uh, colleagues, Well, that's a really good question. Here's the, the good news is that while, quite frankly, we, look, the federal government, we've had, this is the third Monday in a row uh, that the vice president has convened a, a discussion with all of America's governors and the top leaders of the federal government. Now, the information keeps changing and the situation keeps changing, but they are doing a good job of communicating with all the top people in the federal government and everybody's trying to figure this out. I don't know what the conversation is going to be, be about in 10 minutes, but I know that more than 50 governors, including the territories, we, we may have up to 55 governors on that call. Uh, and I think every leader of the federal government will be there. And I think even the president is joining this call for the first time. Um, it, I'm not in the, oval, in the uh, situation room this time, I think for social distancing purposes. I was there the past two weeks. Uh, but we're gonna have, governors are really leading and taking charge in their individual states and they're acting on what they think is the best thing because they're, while the federal government has had some ch guidelines which are changing, they have not given clear directives. And it's, we probably should, I think some of them are hopeful that we can get some tougher uh, actions at the federal level, but they're, 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 they have been working as hard as they can, they are communicating, and hopefully w some of the governors can convince them of the things that we're doing that we think are necessary. Um, I, I think they're going to tell us some information about what they're going to do and steps they're going to take, and it may, I'm not really sure, but it may involve interstate travel. It may involve some of these things that we've taken action on today or last week. Um, you know, I think we were the first or the second in the country to close the schools, and now half the states in the country have done so. Um, some of these actions, we called a state of emergency in the state eight days ago, that, or 10, 11 days ago. They did it on Friday. Um, hopefully, they'll get more out front on this and uh, and I think they'll hear from the governors about what's happening in the various states and maybe come up with some unified strategy. Well, so uh, every state in America has cases now, all 50 states. If you look at the, we had that state, uh, Johns Hopkins has a map. There was a couple dots here and there. Uh, now it's completely red. Um, if, you know, it, this was, uh, I think 13 days ago we had the first case in the United States, and uh, now it's spread everywhere. So that's it's a very rapidly changing situation. But the National Governors Association is convening a, a call this week with just the governors to talk amongst ourselves, and we have the call today, which is the third one, to talk with all the federal leaders re leaders as well. So, um, and I've had uh, ongoing, daily, multiple times a day conversations with governors all across the country all weekend late into the evening with, what are you doing? What actions, what's happening in your state? It's almost like the phone, like phone's ringing off the hook with, uh, what, why did you guys do this? Wh what's happening on the ground? And it's a little bit of a, let's just help each other. I had, you know, Governor DeWine was asking me about what we were doing with uh, daycare, and I sent him immediately our, what we had acted on. I mean, he's taking some aggressive steps on other things, and he and I have been kind of out front on a lot of the stuff, and other governors are asking us. It's we're all in this together, and it doesn't matter if people are Democrats or Republicans or if they're at the in federal level or state level or local government, every one of us has to work together in this crisis to save the lives of Americans. Yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, so
So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to, I'm sorry, Fran Phillips, who's the Deputy Secretary of our Department of Health, who will address some issues, and then I think Karen Salmon and any of the other members of our team. I'm sorry we've got to run for that call with the President and Vice President. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, just to follow up on some of the Governor's remarks, uh, first of all, what we're experiencing here is unprecedented. It is a public health emergency, and this is this is a new virus for which there is obviously no vaccine and there is no medication for treatment. And so in that circumstance, the one response that we can muster is something called social distancing. And that's exactly what you've heard from our governor repeatedly. And so the, the efforts now are every bit as important. When we get a vaccine, when we get a treatment, we will push them out. But the steps that every Marylander can take today to put that distance between themselves and others is vitally important to slow down down the spread of this infection across our state. I'd like to talk about two things that, that were raised uh, and then happy to take other questions. First of all, about testing. Testing is top of mind for so many people. And let me just make some comments about that. We in Maryland, as in the rest of the country, are experiencing a shortage. This is a shortage of the kits and actually the chemicals that go into the lab processing of these tests. So while now there are no longer those strict criteria for who qualifies for testing, there is in fact a logjam that we hope our governor can work with federal officials to clear up that logjam. That's a logjam that every hospital in the state is experiencing and every commercial lab. So let me say this about testing. While it is not as accessible as we want it to be and that we hope it will be, two things. We are putting into motion right now the capability with all county and state government and, and partners to roll out more accessible testing when that's available from the labs. The second thing is who needs to be tested? While I said there's no more strict criteria, this is a question for everyone to consider. If you have flu-like symptoms, let me go through what that might be. Three things to keep in mind. Cough, difficulty breathing, or a fever over 104, those are signs, not necessarily of COVID disease, but those are signs that you absolutely must stay home. You cannot go to work, you cannot go out, you must stay home. Now, if you're home with those symptoms and you're over the age of 60, or if you have underlying conditions, medical conditions, then you need to stay, stay very closely monitoring your condition, and if your fever goes up, or if you have increased difficulty breathing or chest pain, that's a time to either call your doctor or if it's severe to call 911. Not everyone needs to be tested. So until such time as we have adequate testing resources, it's up to all of us to take care of ourselves, monitor our symptoms, and if we start to feel that we're in trouble, call your doctor or call 911. So with regard uh, uh, to the question of surge, of how we are ramping up across the state with our hospital partners uh, and, and, and many, many other partners, let me just say that we have approximately 9,000 hospital beds right now. The, the, the goal is to be able to convert another, bring another 6,000 beds on board, and that's just for acute care. It's very, very important as we look at the trajectory of this disease that we ramp up our outpatient, we ramp up our telehealth and triage, and we ramp up our ability to care for people as they are convalescing if they cannot be at home. So that's a, that's a whole array of partners that we're working with to anticipate and to prepare for a surge in, in medical needs. The, the test results are very, very important. Let me say this, the test is slow. Because of this lack of capacity, we have some, we have three major commercial labs in addition to the state laboratory now that are handling these. They have a tremendous input, tremendous volume, and the thru throughput of these labs is cranking up. So that we are in close, co I mean, we are in electronic communication on every positive case, with ev regardless of what lab. Getting that information back to patients is of utmost interest and concern, and it is the, 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 sub the submitter, in other words, it's the physician or the, or the emergency room that received that test, that, that I'm sorry, that submitted Submitted that test, we'll get that result. So it's your responsibility then to give that information to the patient. To notify the patient, yes, it is. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um,
So that is a perfect world, and it, it anticipates a perfect amount of information that we don't have. And let, let me say that the governor has convened an advisory team, as he's mentioned several times, uh, a response team of the experts, the, really the leading experts in the country who are called on to do this kind of modeling. So there are various models of what, what, what kind of, uh, for example, hospital capacity we'll need going out 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. And so there are some projections. We are close to meeting a doubling of our current capacity. And I think that that's a goal. It's a goal that we are going to continue to work towards. Uh, we are going to take some measures to allow for hospitals to remove some non-urgent patients uh, who may not need to have admitted elective admissions, who may not need that admission to be done right away to, in order to increase capacity. Ventilators, that's, that's an important for people that are very, very acutely ill with a respiratory disease. They may reach a point that they need external ventilation and that kind of support is, is um, in, in ICUs. That is exactly the kind of uh, equipment that we are uh, relying in part on the strategic national stockpile. This is a, a federal effort and this is an effort that would bring supplies and equipment to, to states uh, including uh, not only ventilators but very important personal protective gear so that healthcare workers and others who are managing infected patients have the ability to protect themselves so they can continue to work. And so we're working very closely with the federal government to maximize uh, Maryland's allocation under the strategic national stockpile. How many have you asked for? Or, uh, I, I, can't go, I can't go into those details right now, but we are, we are beginning to receive shipments from the um, stockpile and we're anticipating further in the future. Hopkins Hospital has FDA approval. Hospital That is the one hospital that I'm aware of at this point, uh, and that's changing, that is able to do the testing themselves as a hospital lab, uh, in addition to, as I said, the commercial labs and the state. I know other hospital labs are working very hard to get that approval, and, and we want them to come on board as soon as possible. Uh, I'm happy to answer some of that, General, and, and just to say that we are in very close communication with our military partners uh, across the state and, and also in, in the region, and, and Walter Reed and, and uh, Bethesda Naval and, and, and elsewhere. Well, th this is a partnership. I'll do the first part. Where will they go? They will go home. And that's probably the number one place where they want to go after this experience. So. And then he, the governor said you're under care of the National Guard. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, so yeah, General. Yeah. We're receiving them. We've been working with uh, Dobbins Air Force Base, which is where they're currently located uh, for the last several days. Once they get into Maryland, we're going to uh, make sure that we're, we, first of all, if we know they're their up-to-date status, that they've been tested, we don't have the results back yet, but once we have the up-to-date status, uh, we're going to make the decision whether, you know, the, the mode of transportation, but we intend to take them to their home of record. Okay, well, that's good news. Yeah. Yeah. Very good news. Oh, okay, great. Mr. Hall, you're up next. Can you, um, can you explain a little bit more about the kind of duties we expect guard members to do sure. in Maryland? And also, again, I think I was clear on the numbers. Yep. So since Friday, we've had 400 soldiers uh, on duty, and that, those soldiers and airmen, sorry, uh, have stood up three operation centers, one for a statewide joint operation center, one for Army, and one for air, and uh, they've begun the process of conducting operations and beginning logistics. One of the first units that I called up, the uh, first two units, actually, that I called up were our area support medical companies, and while they don't have the full complement of medical capability because a lot of them, like me, are uh, traditional guardsmen where they have civilian jobs as well. So a lot of them are actually providers and they're out in, in hospitals and, and, and doing their civilian jobs and we don't want to take them away from that. But I still have a lot of other capabilities, things like uh, medics and, and uh, administrative folks that have a, a pretty good role to play in this as well. 
I've got about half of those guys. So we've got a lot of good capability. We're working with uh, Ms. Phillips and her team to, to, to stand up some capabilities across the state in the early stages of that development right now, but we're working closely. We're teaming up with the medical department to do that. We're also conducting transportation missions. One of the things that the governor mentioned was the distribution of the strategic national stockpile mission, particularly personal protective equipment. We're, that's always been a standing mission for us, and we're going to execute that in the coming days. We are prepared for things like aviation mission, uh, other bigger scale transportation missions, and if it comes to it, we're ready for uh, whatever uh, other types of support missions that come up. And you have 400 already. We, I'm sorry, I forgot the numbers. We have 400 right now. We are going to 1,000. Uh, today on state active duty and upwards of 2,200 by uh, in the next coming days. We're, we're, there's a in-processing portion of it, and we'll re there's a throughput rate for that. But ultimately, we're going to have 2,200 people on active duty. Some of those will be on uh, what we're calling like a, a an enhanced readiness status, where they're on uh, a quick turnaround when we need them. Uh, but uh, the vast majority are going to be ready here to support all the the different agencies throughout the state. this time we'll be communicating with the business owners to make sure they're fully aware of the executive order and then we'll take that that routine approach of communicating what the what the expectations are and ensuring that they get those folks to meet those capacity levels and if they don't then we have to look at an enforcement option but hopefully that'll be a, a last option that we have to exercise yes sir protection Well, that's a good question, and the governor and I were just in discussion about that before we came out today. And uh, we are actively looking at the uh, modeling that shows uh, where this is, uh, virus is going, and so we'll be making some decisions about that. The, the reason that I closed schools for two weeks was to give us some time to assess the situation. And uh, I have a call today at 2 o'clock with all the superintendents in Maryland, and we'll be talking about issues that they have thought about and things that we can do in preparation for a potential prolonged periods. I'm also concerned about the, the continuity of instruction, so we'll be talking about those issues today. I wanted to provide just a couple of updates, because I think it's really important that the media gets out the information about meals to students. We applied for a waiver from the federal government to be able to deliver more than uh, two meals per day, and now we're able, uh, we haven't gotten the waiver yet, but we, we went ahead and said we're doing it anyway. Uh, we're providing three meals a day to students, and I would just like that to get out because folks can access that. Um, any child that goes to one of the locations, and the governor uh, talked about the locations, there's a way to find that, and all you have to do is type in MD summermeals.org and all of the locations for meals will come up across the state and that way people can know where to go but students will get um, breakfast and they'll get a milk a fruit or a vegetable and a grain they'll get lunch and supper meals providing milk two fruits and vegetables a grain or bread and a meat or meat substitute and these will be served uh, they're similar to the meals that we serve during a day in school so I just wanted to make sure that that got out we anticipate serving about a hundred thousand meals over the next two weeks so that's uh, that's important information again that website to get uh, information about where these sites are mdsummermeals.org Well, that's part of our discussion today with superintendents and in the future. So those are things, those are definite considerations. And uh, we'll be working on that as a team to try to come up with some uh, answers. Well, 
Well, again, we're going to entertain a lot of different ideas when we discuss this today, and we're going to also look to see what the guidance is from our medical community that the governor, uh, we all are on calls with very frequently uh, to get everyone's uh, best uh, advice on this. It's a very important issue. We're going to try to do that as soon as we can, as soon as we have enough information to make those kinds of decisions. And we'll also probably be looking at putting a lot of resources online for parents so they can access things for their students to do while they are home at, from the state level. Well, we've put, put out some very uh, great guidance for daycare centers. They are currently open now, and uh, we are also opening up additional daycare centers by next Thursday, or by this Thursday, I'm sorry, um, to provide daycare for emergency personnel from our hospitals and also our uh, uh, police units, anyone that needs it that has to come to work because they're essential and emergency personnel. And we've gotten great cooperation from uh, United Way, from Parks and Rec, from senior centers about spots that we can do this. And I have a call at 12 o'clock today with all of the uh, people that run the universities across the state, uh, Secretary Fielder and uh, the people that have the private universities from Mikua. And we're going to talk about using our teachers that are teacher candidates that would normally be doing internships in schools if they were open. We're going to have those uh, try to match them up with daycare centers where they can get their hours but also provide services. Uh, and it will be at really enhanced services to teaching kids that are coming to the daycare centers. Uh, daycare centers have been getting guidance about how to uh, not go over groups of 10, to do frequent cleanings. Um, they have uh, strict guidances, and we've made that public on the website, so you can refer to that. Uh, we certainly hope everyone will be cooperative. I think everyone, uh, as you have heard the governor this morning, everyone is concerned. I think everyone is using good common sense and uh, trying to do whatever they need to do to keep everyone safe. Thank you. If I could add one thing, Dr. Samet reminded me uh, of, of her website and, and for, for your folks. Um, it's health.maryland.gov, compendium of information on coronavirus, or uh, 211 is, is, is available across the state. That will continue. We will continue to post daily uh, on that website. So it'll be, uh, it's, it's health.maryland.gov slash coronavirus. Um, I'm going to tell you that those numbers are going to rise uh, hourly. And uh, we will do one public posting of, from all the labs, that's the commercial labs, the hospital labs, and the state lab at 10 o'clock in the morning. And that will be that point of time. And then it'll be rolling for the next 24 hours and we'll update it. That, that's the best. And we're, we're only posting now positives, no more negatives, no more pendings. We're just getting to the positives. We will also continue to post a map so that we'll have that by jurisdiction. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. 